early development um, and um, mothers, as I mentioned, uh, not only have the capacity to read the affect and act accordingly, but um, in that process, um, their own capacity for establishing that relationship with the baby is activated, the attachment system of mother, and the search for a gratifying relationship with mother constitutes the activation of the attachment system of the baby. It's one of the basic affective systems, attachment. It's not the only one. Together with the attachment, there are other positive systems, as, as well, of course, as other negative systems to which I've referred already. The erotic system is another positive affective system that develops from birth on, although we usually recognize it only later in childhood. The, um, uh, the peer bonding system of, of the playful relation with other uh, individuals of one's own type is another system that becomes important uh, throughout the first years of life. So that attachment is a central early system, the erotic system with slower development and peer bonding with slower development are the positive systems, while on the other hand you have the fight-flight system to escape from dangerous, um, aversive situations as a negative system. And, um, the separation panic system, a basic system connected with the attachment, the negative of the attachment system when um, attachment is threatened, which triggers a basic survival reaction that was first described by Bowlby um, with a um, combination of anxiety, rage, um, um, and, um, and, uh, and the beginning of what later on is depression on the one hand and later on determines a kind of a self-cutting down, self-elimination when attachment doesn't take place, when the panic separation is not effective, leading to detachment avoidance and, ser and may seriously affect the relationship with significant others. So affect activation, the first aspect of the personality, really implies um, the activation of five major systems of which attachment is the most important early one, its counterpart of um, separation panic. In the interaction with mother, the affective memory of that interaction contains from the beginning a perception, a, a, a perception of the self-experience, the experience of mother in the most primitive cognitive perception of her presence in the outside <coughs> world, it may be at first a pictorial impression of light and softness, primary impression of the breast as the source of happiness, gratification, um, gratification of hunger, gratification of anxiety, gratification of erotic needs, and out of which gradually the image of a more total mother will evolve, but will evolve from the first days of life on. So that the affective experience of interaction takes the form of a self-representation relating to an other representation, object representation, under the, in, under the frame of a predominant <coughs> affect. So the gratifying relation with mother leads to an idealized sense 
of a happy self relating to a totally gratifying object in the context of a happy primary experience. To the contrary, moments of fear, of hunger, of pain that are not gratified activate the separation panic system, anxiety, at first it's a formless, empty blackness we might say, but that gradually takes the form of a bad world that is attacking one and it's an attacked, threatened, terrible sense of self surrounded by an universe that cannot be understood and that induces a negative reaction of intense rage, anxiety and that, as I mentioned already, contains the seed of the later depressive reaction when a needed and loved object is not available. And these experiences of an idealized relation between self and other or, to the contrary, the absence as an experienced terrible situation between a suffering self and, and a hostile, diffuse other are primary peak affect experiences that are stored separately in the hippocampus. The, the only way to bring affective systems together is in, in that prefrontal, central prefrontal area that I mentioned to you. They are stored separately and determine a subjective, a primary subjective world of idealized and persecutory experiences of self relating with a significant other. These two segments of psychological experience uh, have an important function in predicting future behavior. The affective memory of good experiences determines behavior patterns tending to bring up again, to bring out new experiences of the same kind. Gradually, all frustrating experiences bring about the memory of dangerous, frustrating experiences that have to be avoided. Pain, darkness, uh, hunger come together in a bad experience of a, of a hostile world in sharp contrast to the gratification of the normal uh, relationship. Mother's breast, mother, light, physical contact, sensorial gratification. So the internalization of these extreme experiences in two separate kind of worlds is gradually integrated with other memories, non-affective memory internalization that, that, are, that are determined by the total Cort the to total cortex of the brain in which ongoing learning occurs also under conditions of low affect activation. The baby, when it doesn't have intense positive or negative feelings, is curious, explores the environment and there, there is an affective system geared to the exploration of the environment, to become interested in the environment and to be connected to those other affective systems that at the moment are dominant. This general system called seeking system operates under <coughs> low affective active activation in acquiring general knowledge about what is going on in the world and that contributes gradually to enriching the subjective experience um, with neutral information and a gradually more objective way of looking at 
of the world that surrounds the baby. <coughs> this internalization of significant experiences from birth on of relation of self representation, object representation systems determines then behavior patterns in which the, the internalization of such relationship, what we call internalization of early object relation, determines uh, models of behavior in terms of attachment theory, the, the, af the affective memory of early experiences become models, internal models of behavior in terms of psychoanalytic object relations theory become internalized object relations that then determine habitual ways of interacting with the environment in terms of one's own experience that we call character, the second major component of the personality. Character is the dynamic integration of habitual behavior patterns that is established from birth on gradually throughout the early years and one might say that character is the product of the interaction between temperament and object relations, their internalization as affective object relations, that their determination of such behavior patterns. So character is the product of interaction between temperament and the internalized interaction with environment. <coughs> the development of character as objective behavior goes hand in hand with the subjective development of a gradual integration of these opposite segments of early experience that I referred to before. And now they are being sorted out in terms of a sense of permanent aspect of the self, the integration of a subjective experience of permanence of self, and the integration of the experience of significant others that gradually sort themselves out at more permanent representations of significant others that become more and more realistic. So that the self-representations at first of an ideal kind and a terrible kind and the realistic one under moments of calmness gradually are integrated into an integrated concept of self. And the trans transient experiences of significant others into permanent experiences of significant others that constitute an internal world of the representation of significant others, an internal world of object relations. We call the combination of an integrated sense of self and an integrated sense of significant others identity, normal identity, so that the subjective correspondence to the development of character is identity, or one might say the behavioral correspondence to identity is character. The third component of the personality that becomes important derives from the internalization of relationships with significant others, but derives from experiences that don't have an immediate practical, instrumental nature, <coughs> but that refer to general rules and regulations how to behave to survive and do a right in the world. They derive from all the aspects of interaction in which the baby is taught no, no, or yes, that's the way you should be. In other words, demands and prohibition. And an internalized world of demands on prohibition builds up gradually as an internalized structure of ethical demands on prohibition that in psychoanalytic language is called the superego and that has an, an extremely important function in permitting the orientation 
in the psychosocial world at large has practical importance in that failure in the development of that segment of the personality is the prognostically most important indicator in the treatment of severe personality disorders. A final component of the personality is the cognitive organization of experience itself. I already referred to the cortex as the organ in which the cognitive experience um, is internalized and organized. That cognitive experience um, is particularly centered on the capacity to abstract general rules of reality, of um, behavior, of uh, the predictability um, of the environment, the scientific thinking of the mind, so to speak, signaled by the, particularly by the function of abstraction. And the capability of abstraction is the main manifestation of um, cognition of intelligence. And, by th and today we know that intelligence, measured practically by intelligence quotient, is um, determined in part genetically, which genetic determination of the development of the cortex, and in part culturally, in that the cognitive stimulation by the environment, <coughs> especially in the first few years of life, the first five or six years of life, is a crucial contributor to the development of intelligence, of cognitive functioning. So it's a combined genetic, constitutional, and uh, psychosocial, um, uh, psychosocially determined structure. The cortex is also the seat of consciousness. In other words, the capacity of conscious self-reflection, conscious aspects of memory. But it's important to keep in mind that the earliest patterns of interaction their internalization, their transformation in habitual behavior patterns occurs unconsciously in, in, is um, an instrumental form um, of, of learning um, that does not reach consciousness or only indirectly later on, while later experiences reach consciousness. Uh, the normal brain, the normal cortex functions unconsciously as well as consciously at all times. Two fifths of our um, cortex is occupied with conscious thinking. Three fifths operate unconsciously. Um, practical implication. If we have a simple problem, we resolve it consciously. If it is extremely complicated, and we can't solve it. Sometimes we're saying, I have to sleep it over. And next morning, we find a solution. In effect, it has been empirically demonstrated that the solution found on the next days are better than those immediately with extremely complex problem because of the ongoing process of unconscious cognitive organization. So, in short, um, temperament, character, identity, internal ethical system, and intelligence are the components of the personality. The internalization of object relations in the sense of those units, dynamic units of self-representation linked with object, re object representation under the impact of a dominant affect become basic structural development of the tripartite structure that Freud described as part of psychoanalytic theory. They get first integrated, as I mentioned, into identity and the integrated concept of self and the integrated concept of significant others become the essential structures of the ego as described by Freud. 
the internalization of value systems becomes the superego. And that, in, that is a complex process in which the earliest fantastic demands and prohibitions having to do with severely distorted experiences of demands and prohibition of earliest childhood, early primitive prohibitions are gradually modified by earliest idealist, idealized views of how one should be to be loved by one's parents. So that there is a segment of persecutory demands and prohibitions and then of idealized demands and prohibition that gets integrated into more realistic <coughs> internalized system of moral beliefs what's really the Freudian superego and so that ego and superego are really the development of complex evolving in internalized representations of the relationship between self and others and at the same time these psychological uh, these psychological structures ego and superego determine a gradual development of an elimination from consciousness of experience of basic threatening experiences that are of a, such threatening and dangerous kind that they cannot be tolerated as part of one's patrimony of acceptable behaviors so that extremely unacceptable aggressively tinged experiences and extremely unacceptable sexually tinged experiences are repressed and they become what in Freudian language is called the it or the dynamic unconscious. So the dynamic unconscious are really repressed internalized relations between self and other <laughs> under the impact of um, within the frame of unacceptable extremely aggressive or intolerable sexual experiences. How does the normal personality look like? What do we call normality? Um, it, um, there are infinite descriptions, but in, in this regard, I think there is less controversy in the sense that it implies a general, well-integrated sense of self, a generally well-integrated world of significant <coughs> others, in other words, the capacity to realistically be able to recognize other people and recognize them not only in terms of internal behavior, but the permanent aspects of their personality out of the synthesis that one achieves. And in that regard, I um, neglected to mention one important function in one's knowledge of other people, namely the capacity to attribute an independent mind to others, theory of mind, that goes in parallel to the capacity for reflecting about one's own mind. We know that um, the capacity to differentiate self from other develops practically from the first few weeks of life on. There's empirical evidence of um, cross-modal experience. In other words, a baby um, gets um, around a ball into his mouth and then is presented with a cube and a ball and he looks more at the ball than at the cube. If you give him a cube in his mouth and then present him with the two, he looks at the cube. In other words, the baby is able to transfer a subjective experience into a, a sensorial subjective experiences into a visual one. 
the baby, the baby is able to recognize mother's voice and um, uh, to differentiate um, mother from other um, subjects from the earliest days and weeks of life on. So we know that the capacity to differentiate itself from other is very, very premature. The capacity to assume that other people have, ex have think, have, have psychological experiences goes in parallel to the awareness of one's own affective experiences. The baby originally tends to attribute to mother the same affect that the baby has and only gradually is able to, to separate that experience which is part of normal attachment. Part of normal attachment, normal attunement by mother is to signal to the baby that she can, she understands the affect of the baby. She can respond congru congruently, but at the same time her affect is marked, is different from that of the baby. So the baby gradually begins to distinguish the affect of mother from one's own, instead of living at a world of equivalence. And at a certain point, children become aware that others may have faulty thinking because they don't have all the evidence that the child has for deciding what reality is. This capacity to critically examine other people's thought, to realistically and critically examine other people's thought, only occurs at the end of the third year, beginning of the fourth year of life. At which point, theory of mind gets finally established. But theory of mind has to be differentiated from the capacity for empathy. The capacity for empathy is a different function that operates from birth on by mechanisms still unknown, which we call contagion. Babies in the crib, a baby starts crying, all the babies start crying. Um, uh, so there are very <coughs> primitive mechanisms uh, that then get complicated by mechanisms that we have come to understand, which are called the mirroring uh, functions. Uh, mirror systems, first discovered by Galese in terms of the mirroring of uh, movement and perception, really has m much more complicated structures uh, that permit mirroring of emotional experiences of others in terms of all the cues, sensorial cues and affective memories cues um, that one has uh, accumulated. So there are complex mirroring systems such as in the insula and other brain regions is a second major system that determines empathy. And finally, empathy is strongly uh, reinforced by the capacity to integrate total experiences at the moment when the idealized and persecutory segments of the mind can be integrated. So, empathy has complex origins and the normal personality then has a capacity to assess oneself, to have a realistic experience of self. In other words, the capacity to be able to differentiate a momentary state of mind from one's general um, consistent personality, consistent self, to do the same with all others, and to obtain gratifying relationships with significant others 